Looks like we've kind of stabilized. We got 23 attendees. And if you want me to go ahead and just go on this, let me know when I should go on the screen share. I've got this up and I can pull up our. Oh, and here's James. There's a man. Perfect timing. Look at that. Excellent timing, James. James, how are you? Good. Sorry hey, that uh, I was late, Alex. I hope you got my email. I did. Good. We're all set. Jacob, how are you doing? I'm doing very well. Um, we were just, you know, catching up. I mean, as well as we can be doing in the middle of the pandemic, um, yeah. you know, but overall, uh, as I was saying to the other members, phenomenal just because of this phenomenal staff of folks I get to work with every day who do a great job. So, you know, I got good people, so things are going well because of them. So hanging in there. Good. All right, All right we're well, ready to like we're, share. We're live and if you'll share your screen, uh, Jacob, we'll, I'll go ahead and start with the introduction. Okay. Shouting out into the ether. Very good. It's very difficult to do this without being able to see the public you know, faces, but uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and welcome everybody to um, the August 12th virtual meeting of the Board of Architecture Review Large for the City of Charleston. My name is Jake White. I'm acting as chair this evening. Uh, other board members that are present this afternoon are James Metters and Leon Scott. And then representing city staff, we have Jacob Lindsay. Alex Howell and Lawrence Courtney. Uh, and as a reminder, the order of the meeting uh, is as follows. First, there'll be an introduction and brief overview of the project by um, city staff. The, this would be uh, Jacob speaking here. And then uh, ap the application will be presented by the applicant. Uh, we'll shoot for a 10 minute time limit. And if you need more time for your presentation, then please alert me and um, depending upon my disposition in that moment, I may grant additional time. Um, that will be followed by any questions of the applicant by the board or staff. Um, any presenters, please state your name uh, for the record uh, whenever you speak, just because of the nature of the online meeting. And also keep in mind that any persons that are affiliated with the project, whether you're the owner, developer, contractor, or consultant, uh, please speak during this period rather than during public comment. Uh, the applicant's presentation will be followed by uh, an equivalent amount of time for public comment. Uh, and then after that, there'll be the city staff comments and recommendation. This will be followed by a couple of minutes for an applicant response or clarification to either public comment or the city staff comments. And then once that is concluded, we'll proceed to board discussion and a vote. Um, at this point, the applicant can uh, clarify any inaccurate information when recognized by me as the chair, raise a hand in the Zoom fashion and wait to be called on. Uh, but otherwise, you, you should only speak if you're asked a question by a board member. Uh, none of our items this evening have been withdrawn or deferred. Uh, please remember to turn off all cell phones or other devices. If you're playing video games in the background, we do not want to hear that. Uh, so please limit your comments to architecture only. Uh, this board's jurisdiction is limited to that, not zoning or issues of, uh, of trash collection or noise or uh, rowdy students. So uh, with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Lindsay to um, proceed to the first item. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I'd like to just first of all, um, say thank you to all the board members and to the staff and uh, that it's a real honor to be here. And especially in Mr. Dowd's absence, as you all know, my friend and colleague Dennis Dowd served for many years as the city staff lead for this board. And until we acquire a new city architect and that search is completed, um, you'll be seeing myself as well as Mr. Courtney um, and our wonderful additional staff, um, Linda Bennett and Alex Howell, who all contribute to, to this, this wonderful um, effort that is the Board of Architectural Review. So um, thanks for letting me assist and it's good to be with you all. Just a, a technical question here because I'm running from a multi-monitor screen. Are you all seeing my full screen share? Or are you seeing the uh, PowerPoint with the slides at the side? Can you gui guide me there? The it's screen share is on your screen. other screen. Yeah. yeah. What I'm going to yeah. do here is just reshare re that and hopefully I can get um, can get that correctly shared. Okay, how about now? Yep, there you go. Beautiful. Okay. okay, very good. Well, um, we'll go ahead and get things started off here and we will move to our next slide. Okay, um, 
So, uh, Mr. Chair, do you want to read this, or is this for for me to go through all of our overall uh, instructions? I think I think we have to do rock paper scissors to figure that out. I mean, <laughs> I, can, I, can, I can go over it very quickly. Uh, this has been uh, the city's protocol for use of uh, Zoom for virtual board meetings for now several weeks. So any of you who are frequent participants or observers will recognize this. But um, if you're here, you've already found the link to online access. Uh, you know, there's a phone number there uh, that you can call if you ever have trouble with that. Um, the public comment instructions are pretty important. Um, you will have needed to alert the city by uh, noon yesterday if you were going to risk request an opportunity to speak. Um, members of the public that, that intend to speak this evening on any application um, are already known by Alex Howell and he will, he will cue you up uh, to, to turn your microphone on and on and I guess video as well if you have it uh, so that you can speak on the application of your interest and then, and then that'll be it. Um, we have uh, a number, this is not on the screen before you, but we have a number of public comments that have been uh, submitted in writing. And it's pertinent to say that submitting your comments in writing to the board or to the city is every bit as valid of public participation as speaking live here tonight. So I think we can go on from, from here. Uh, and I'll read this too. Um, so staff, staff being uh, Mr. Lindsay is controlling the PowerPoint. Uh, applicants will need to ask him to advance slides uh, according to the pace of their presentation. Uh, please, if you're speaking, give your name uh, at each occasion in which you speak. That'll just make the audio recording all the more accurate and clear. Um, attendees, videos, and microphones have all been disabled. Uh, and when Alex cues you up to speak, then you can turn on both. Some applicants have been confused thinking that they only have audio access. You can turn on your camera when, when you go live to present before the board. Uh, it's much better than having a disembodied voice. Uh, chat and QA functions have been disabled for everyone. Um, and then again, for public comment, uh, for those of you who have, who have registered in accordance with what you saw on the last slide, um, you'll be called in order by project to speak on that. And uh, please, after you speak, remain for the rest of the item so you can understand what occurs. There are occasions where an applicant uh, will pull an application right in the midst of proceedings and you won't have known that unless you stay until the, uh, the a motion is, is uh, made and uh, passed. Um, let's see. Board members are listed as participants and we have the ability to open a panel that shows each board member and, and you can see the status of each of our microphones. I think most of us will probably stay muted until it's time to talk just for audio clarity. All right, next. And uh, for those of us on the board, please remember that when we, when we uh, make our vote, please say either yay in favor or nay not in favor just for absolute audio clarity. And I'm going to reread the motion verbatim and whichever board member has made the motion will, will need to um, need to correct me if I'm if I'm off. We're looking for we're looking for accuracy in the motions. Um, I don't think we have any recusals tonight, but uh, so I'll skip over that part. And it's it's extremely rare that the board ever goes into executive session, but should we do that, we will we will sort of step aside here and and um, convened via a, a conference line and then return, return to the Zoom meeting after that executive session has concluded. Um, you can go to the city's website to see results of this meeting and then there's additional contact information, uh, uh, in, especially if you're having technical problems. And do keep in mind that uh, all of this is being recorded. All right, next. Okay. Very good. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, with that introduction, uh, we will go ahead and move on to our first agenda item. And agenda item number one is 529 King Street. And this is simply a one-year extension of an existing approval for demolition of the existing structure. Um, this was originally granted in October 11th, 2017. This is not a rated building. Um, it was built around 1948, and it's in the old and historic district. And for those of you who know this site, this is here on Upper King Street. This, of course, was Dixie Furniture. Um, and the uh, staff comments is that first, this is the second extension of the demolition approval originally granted. And by ordinance, um, this may be granted for one year up to five times after the two year expiration date. 
So our recommendation is our recommendation is for approval and the extension of the demo. Okay. Is there an applicant presentation for this one, Alex? N not really. We have someone okay. on on the line, but if there's any questions, but not really necessary. Well, I'm sure that someone would love to speak, but we may just proceed on to board discussion if that's all right. Any board discussion or a motion? Mr. Chairman, uh, this is James. I will make a motion for approval of the okay. demolition project extension. Okay, so we have a motion for uh, approval of the extension of the demolition. Do we have a second? I will second. This is Lee Scott. Okay. All right. That said, we have a motion that has been made and seconded. Uh, Mr. Metters, how do you vote? I in favor. Mr. Scott, how do you vote? Yay in favor. And I vote yay in favor. So the motion passes 3-0. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Moving on to agenda item number two, um, 98 Wentworth. This is also a demolition um, of a one-story building uh, known as Croft Hall. This is in Harleston Village. It was built after 1959. And of course, it's in the old and historic district. This is located on Wentworth Street, immediately adjacent to the Grace Church Cathedral. And there are just a few uh, street level photographs of the existing building. You can see it here in relationship, obviously to the main cathedral itself and Wentworth Street. And this is just the building in question all the way to the left, looking down Wentworth and looking in the other direction. Here you see it on your right. And with that, we'll turn it over to the applicant's presentation. All right, we have three applicant presenters. I'm gonna promote Simmons Young to a panelist. Susan Carter and Michael Wright. Okay, I think I'm in. Can you all hear me okay? Yes, yes we can. We can. Uh, just one clarification. Um, Jay, you mentioned raise your hand. Is that literally this if you have a comment? Or is there a. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, no, you have to dance um, <laughs> if you can't. Yeah, no, since you're on video, please just like literally raise your hand, wave it about and we'll find you. Okay, sounds good. Um, but you have, you have the floor, so you don't have to do it right now. <laughs> sounds good. So if we could go to the first slide, um, this will be followed by another application right after this. Uh, the building is 1959. We could go to the next slide. Um, and these slides are sort of small, so if you see me squinting at the screen, that's what it is. Um, th this is just a survey showing uh, the existing building. And then, uh, Grace, this was done in 2000. This survey was done in 2000. Um, so you don't see a courtyard that's between the cathedral and the, um, what's the Johnson building. So it's just sort of a big white mass. And the building highlighted to the left is Croft Hall. We go to the next slide. Um, these are some Sanborn maps. The building was built in 1959. And it was kind of an afterthought when the uh, Johnson building to the, uh, to the east of the cathedral was built. One of the um, donors for that building was, was really intent on having a youth club building. And so he donated some money to have this built. And it was not built all that well. It's just concrete block um, and some stucco, shingle roof. Uh, there's a fireplace that was never uh, built and currently it serves as part of Grace Little School and it's divided into um, four smaller uh, classrooms. Okay and then we could go to the next slide. Um, these are the 1959 drawings uh, showing Croft Hall and on the lower left uh, if it's possible to zoom in, that'd be great. If not, I'll just mention it. To the um, left of the cathedral, there is a building that will be maybe relevant for the next presentation, which is a, a building that was demolished, a, a three-story building to the left. And you can see that's dashed in. Um, that was demolished when they built Croft Hall. Uh, and we could go to the next slide. Is just a few photos of the building, and I think we're already oriented to that. Um, and hopefully, had a chance to ride, or I'm sure you've seen this building driving around town um, or stop by today. And I think that may be the last slide. 
Yeah. So with that, I would open it up to, to any questions. Okay. Any questions from the board of staff? Uh, Jay, I went by the, uh, the building uh, today and Simmons, it, uh, it appears this is a, a concrete block building that maybe has a brick veneer on the outside and then stuccoed. And I mean, from from a structural standpoint, I mean, it look it looks fine. There, there's still windows to it. There's these uh, cast pieces uh, around the windows, um, but it's uh, it is a concrete block building with maybe a brick veneer and then stucco. And uh, but this is not because the building is is uh, not in good condition. It's it's just. Uh, there's not a lot of significant unique qualities about it, correct? That's correct, and, and we do have a, a need for a new use um, that does require some more space. Yep. Thank you. Okay, any other questions from the board or staff? If not, we will proceed on to public comment. Is there any public comment on this one, Alex? No public comment on the demolition. Oh man, it's my favorite part. Um, all right, well, uh, let's move on then to city recommendation. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, city comments, uh, staff comments are, first of all, that um, it's a basic utilitarian structure, as was just mentioned. It has few character-defining architectural elements um, contributing little to the neighborhood and the city. And if there are any reusable architectural elements that are salvageable, um, they should be removed and stored for possible future use elsewhere. So staff recommendation is for approval for demolition um, with any special architectural elements uh, to be salvaged. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Young, any response to that? Uh, we will uh, salvage the steel windows and, and look at how the cast stone come, can come out. Okay, thank you. All right, so board discussion. Uh, motion, Mr. Chair? Yeah, sure. Go right ahead. Make a uh, motion for approval of the uh, demolition of the structure. Uh, including staff comments. So motion for approval of demolition, including staff comments. Do we have a second? This is Leon Scott. I will second. Thank you. Sorry, y'all are just going to be tag teaming this all night, I'm afraid. Uh, <laughs> all right, so we have an, a, a motion and, and, a, uh, and a second. Mr. Matters, how do you vote? A yay in favor. Uh, Mr. Scott. Yay in favor. I vote yay in favor as well. The motion passes 3-0. Okay, very good, Mr. Chair. Um, hearing no no other words on that, we'll move on to our third agenda item, which is also at the same address. This is the future building um, proposed to go in the same location, 98 Wentworth Street. So this is a conceptual approval request for new construction of a two-story addition to the existing church complex. The existing uh, church is in fact a category one, which of course is our most significant designation for historic buildings. Um, it is in a three-story height district and of course the old and historic district. So just as the previous site, uh, same location uh, here on Wentworth Street, which we just viewed. Um, again, the site here is in the location of the building that you just approved for demolition on the left, here on the right. And with that, I'll turn it over to the applicant for presentation. Okay, uh, the Dean and Rector, Michael Wright, will uh, introduce the project and the background on it, if that's, uh, if we could switch over to him, please, Alex. They are both at panelists, and they just need to unmute, um, mute, mute themselves. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Sure can. Very good. Well, thank you for this opportunity. Um, I'm just going to uh, just briefly uh, begin the process by saying, um, re related to the need of this, uh, uh, this building, uh, this is not a new need. This is a need that probably is uh, almost a generation uh, it's taken uh, for us to get to this point. You may recall a number of years ago, uh, the, we were at the point of uh, building or requesting a, a similar type of building. And it's at that time when uh, we discovered the tower was unstable at Grace. And uh, so about 15 years later and $12 million later, we stabilized the, the building and uh, it's back the way it needs to be. We're now uh, at the point where we have to look at the original need, which is more space because of our growing congregation. As it turns out, when we looked at this about 15 years ago, um, the uh, membership was about 1,575 people. 
and the, the need was raised for additional space for all of our community and congregational work. Uh, now, 15 years later, our membership is 3,250. So uh, this has been an ongoing need related to growth, not about expected growth, but actually being able to service uh, the needs of the community and the congregation at the present time. And so just to give you that introduction is to say, this is not something that uh, we've raised recently. It's been an ongoing discussion and we're, we're thrilled that we've now made it to this point that we can come before you uh, with something a little more tangible. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. I'll, I'll move into um, the architecture of the building. We started working on this in, uh, about a year and a half ago and uh, um, really gathering programming needs more than defining a building, which didn't happen until um, much later. Uh, so uh, if we could go to the next slide, the cathedral is 1846. Um, these Sanborn maps show, uh, tell an interesting story. Um, the outlined building on the upper left is the cathedral. And then um, actually in this, in this Sanborn map, east is shown as up. On the corner of Glebe and Wentworth Street, there was a four story structure. Um, and then uh, in 19, uh, 1902, uh, the upper right hand side, there was a three story structure. Um, the one that we looked at that was demoed when Croft Hall was built, that was approximately 15 feet away from the cathedral if the uh, uh, drawing was scaled correctly in 1959. Um, so there's been an evolution of buildings um, in late 1990s. There was an addition on the back of the cathedral. Um, and again, the two 1959 sort of flankers. One is Johnson Hall, which houses um, the current gathering hall and uh, and the other has part of the little school. We could go to the next slide. Um, so this is just a rendering and then uh, enlarged Sanborn showing those two buildings in particular that I spoke about that were close and then another um, building to the west which was uh, two stories on a raised basement with an attic and we'll see a photo on the next slide. Um, so this is looking from the east with the, uh, I guess they, they mark it as four stories. It looks kind of like three, three stories over an eight foot, um, seven or eight foot um, raised basement. Um, that's sort of blocking the view of the cathedral. I think they're probably standing where the fraternity row is um, roughly. We can go to the next slide. Uh, this is probably standing. the slide on the right, the image on the right is um, probably standing somewhere near the uh, front of Glenn McConnell, um, the College Charleston dormitory. You can see that two and a half story building on the left. It's all the way pushed up against the street and then sort of a raggedy wooden fence uh, and then a, um, a, a cast iron or wrought iron um, fence that was in front of the cathedral and apparently there was a three story building pushed back approximately 50 feet from the street where that ratty fence is. Uh, we could go to the next slide. This is the uh, just a site plan sort of orienting everything. You can see Croft Hall in relation to the new building uh, in that uh, site context. And, and it's just worth noting that the College of Charleston has uh, the dorm I just mentioned, uh, and then also uh, um, their student center, Stern Center, uh, and, and some other larger buildings nearby. So it's sort of a mix. Uh, neighborhood in here. We could go to the next, please. Then, um, the photo on the, we'll just go clockwise from the upper left, is is coming down Wentworth Street with the um, spire of the cathedral in the distance, some College of Charleston buildings blocking a little bit of the view. To the right of that is a parking lot that we share with the College of Charleston. We own the first row of spaces. We have an easement um, allowing access through, which will come important when we look at the site plan. Um, and then Croft Hall in the front of the building with the cloister on the lower right and, uh, and Johnson Hall on the lower right. We go to the next, please. Uh, upper left is Glen Connell dorm. Um, to the right of that is just looking down Wentworth Street with the three-story college building that's being currently braced. Um, 
and the fraternity row. We could go to the next slide. And just stop me if you all want to look closer at photos. Um, these are kind of from the back of the building. There's a 1990s edition that is a drive under with uh, the choir room and, and choir director's office above them. Um, you'll note the playground for the little school is kind of pushed up against the building and uh, it's not really a safe uh, way for kids to get back and forth. There's some of the little schools in the older building and some of it is in Croft Hall. So um, if you go out there, you sort of, uh, the kids push out an exit, a fire stair uh, escape exit that goes straight into that uh, drive through. So that's one of the things we want to ameliorate. Now the next slide. Um, some more context and you'll see this, I think, in a site plan a little bit easier, um, which I'll get to. Uh, next slide. So this is sort of an overall view uh, to give you kind of a quick glimpse of, of what the agenda is here. We started with four design principles that we stuck with. The, sort of throughout and um, that we felt were important. The first is that the cathedral is the most significant building and everything should defer to it. Um, the second is that the massing on Wentworth Street should be complementary to the Johnson building um, on the right. However, the building must be larger to accommodate the growing congregation and administrative needs. Uh, it's worth mentioning currently the clergy and administrative administration is in a building diagonally across the street at 115 Wentworth, so it's about a half a block walk. Uh, another design principle is that the interior experience uh, of the parish hall and the offices should um, have a strong visual connection to the cathedral. One of the things about the gathering hall, I'm fortunate to spend a lot of Sundays there, I'm a member of the congregation, but the gathering hall that's in the Johnson building on the right is pretty disconnected from um, the cathedral. And we've got the opportunity with this one to look out at just an incredible west facade with stained glass windows and stucco and, and looking at the back of this um, spire. And then also the offices you'll see have that opportunity. Um, we could go to the next slide. And this is just a survey. One thing worth noting Again, the parking spaces you see on the left were acquired uh, in 2000 when we started this um, campaign for a new building. Um, and beneath them is a, uh, is a tunnel that, has the, that carries uh, power from the central plant for the College of Charleston over to Glen McConnell dorm. Um, so it's not simply parking. There's two transformers in that little island and then a uh, manhole that's under there. So that's an interesting easement. Um, uh, we could go to the next, yeah. Uh, the proposed building is, is cited, um, the siting shown here. We are, um, the idea is that we're narrower, more narrow at the front. Um, so the building is about um, seven feet, uh, four inches at the front. And then it, as it gets behind a cloister, it widens up. Um, there's a ramp on the left-hand side from the handicap uh, accessible parking places that bring you to kind of um, the entry point for the gathering hall up front and then at the back of the building, this is sort of the everyday use. Um, if I were gonna go drop my kids at choir or if, um, if you were gonna go to um, discuss a funeral or plan a wedding or whatever that might be, that function might be, that's probably the door that you would use. Um, and it's got sort of the guts in the building in the back with bathrooms and kitchens. Uh, and I, I think we'll hear a little bit later about the kitchen need and what the church does in, in this building um, from Susan Carter. Uh, a lot of the little school gets pushed into the older building and the playground goes to the top uh, of the um, site and the parking lot gets shrunk a little bit. So the little school is all now um, grouped together, which is, I think, very helpful and it's a safer entry onto the playground. And the kids are more protected in the back of the building. We could go to the next slide, please. Uh, the floor plan, I think I just talked about that. The, 
influence uh, of the floor plan. You can see the pilasters of the um, cathedral. Uh, those sort of carry across with beams and um, columns in, and also the windows we'll see in the elevations um, aligned with the center lines of the um, stained glass windows. And we could, I think, go to the next slide. Uh, this is the second floor that has the the clergy offices and it has this double height space that opens to the uh, hall below. There's a storefront that separates it for privacy reasons, but but the idea is that uh, if you're in these offices, if you're in your clergy, you sort of recognize that you work at a cathedral and, and it's very visible, it's right there. So you can sort of, um, I think, appreciate that uh, connection. Again, the guts of the building are sort of in the back with um, bathrooms, stairs, elevators, um, reception, and the connection, of course, to the 1990s building. In 1998, it was important to define, and still is important to define the back corner of the building. Um, you'll see that job, the walls of the existing building are in gray and the new building are in black. So you'll see that jog at the north, um, northwest corner of the cathedral that was done intentionally to define the corner of this building. Um, and if you go back and look at the photos, the, uh, the um, top of the parapet of the new 1998 building is about a foot higher than the eave of the clear story of, this, of um, the cathedral. There's a one story part um, of the building that you saw probably on the first floor that has the kitchen uh, and that's the part that goes into the courtyard a bit. The courtyard is 25 feet uh, wide. And uh, there's the, yeah, the one-story kitchen. And the, uh, we felt that was important to, again, show the corner and feature that corner of the building. Um, the cloister is approximately the same size. I think it's um, uh, 38 feet from, the, from our building to the um, base of cathedral side aisle and on the other side uh, it's 42 feet so there's a little bit of uh, play that we have to do which you'll see on the uh, next slide please roof plan um, we bump up and we'll see this more in elevation but we bump up in a couple places um, the next slide please so the streetscape view uh, I think Looking on the north side of the street at the top of the page, you can see the uh, existing addition. We actually join up in the middle of those two windows at the very back in the distance, sort of a light gray color. Um, and then the new building is a bit shorter than that. The guiding principle is the, the eave line of the clear story, which is at about 38 feet. Um, we're, we're sticking it um, right, right below that, um, 37 something, 37.4 for the parapet uh, of the main building. And then um, the, as we get closer to the cathedral, with, uh, we step down about five feet approximately um, for that side um, bay that's pushed back behind the cloister. So uh, the idea is as you get closer to the cathedral, you push back and you step down. Um, you probably can't see my hands, <laughs> but uh, I'm making motions. On the next side of, uh, the street, yeah, next slide is fine. Next, the other side of the street, um, you just see the outline of the building and it's massing in comparison. Uh, we could go to the next slide. Um, so on this elevation, we felt it was important to leave the Gothic arches to the cathedral. Um, we have sort of a segmented arch on, on our side um, on this building. It's a three part division of the front part of the building um, three part windows in the Dean's office, uh, ganged windows and a little bit of relief to the, uh, to the elevation, um, where pilasters stick out. Uh, the cloister is ascent. We're trying to make it exactly the same, uh, as far as architectural detailing as the one on the right side of the building. It's a rare place that you see both these things at the same time. Um, so we think the dimensional difference is, is not going to be picked up um, on uh, a regular uh, day. We could move, I think, to the next slide. 
Okay, on the top of this page is the north um, elevation, which faces the stern center. There is a, a, a central um, uh, atrium, which was the 1998 building. You can see sort of the drive through arch, um, drive under building, which we filled in in order to pick up some of the little school program. Uh, and then those windows are where the lobby, uh, elevator lobby is, and the covered entry uh, as you move to the right. In the bottom elevation, the west elevation, um, we've got windows. The idea is that, that those windows align with the um, stained glass windows. And again, um, you sort of have two masses on either end with a lower uh, structure in the middle that those parapets pop up about one foot four inch on uh, each side of the um, central gathering space. Storage on the left, so we have a little bit of a, yeah, that's fine, we can go to the next slide. Apologies, too quick on the draw. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. Um, this slide is useful because uh, it shows the, the top section. It, if I'd been thinking when, when we put all this together, we would have slid over a little bit more because it does show the 38 foot, um, it would show the 38 foot um, top of a clear story wall. That's what you're seeing is a 23 foot top of side aisle highlighted in black there. Um, and this just shows some of the spatial relationships and, and that ceiling height on the first floor. We, we live with a um, rather low ceiling and a strange proportioned room uh, over in Han Hall. And now when we plan on this building, we want something that, you know, that has a, a better uh, ceiling height and proportion, uh, particularly in the gathering hall. Double height space, you can see how the, that relates, the glass wall relates to the cathedral. And um, beneath that, uh, sort of the part division for the um, side bay that's behind the cloister. Uh, and you can see where it pops up um, in the back for the parapet wall. Are we doing okay on time, Jay? Uh, well, you could accelerate a little bit. I was just about <laughs> to, I didn't want to interrupt your flow, but uh, it could go faster. Okay, um, let's go to the next slide. I think we're pretty close to the end perspectives. Um, and we could go to the next one. And I can come back to any of these if you have questions about them. The side ramp, I guess, is important to talk about um, that allows the handicap access, wheelchair access up to the front door of the building. And I think that may be the last slide. Is that? Uh, it is. Is that right? OK. So I will okay. open your questions there. Yeah, great. All right. Any board or staff questions? It, um, Simmons, what was your Oh, this is James, sorry. What, what was your first principle, your first design principle? That the cathedral is the most significant building and that other parts of the campus should defer to it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Anything else? All right, well, let's move on to public comment. I know we have a couple of letters, uh, one in particular, I think both, uh, but I think that rather than read the letter, I think both the Historic Charleston Foundation and Preservation Society have people in the audience. So I guess we'll move on to verbal public comment and then I'll read a letter into the record. All right, we'll start with Anna Catherine Carroll and you should be able to unmute yourself. Thank you, Anna Catherine Carroll with the Preservation Society of Charleston. The Preservation Society appreciates the applicant reaching out to us on this project. And first, we feel that this is a successful design approach that is quite compatible with the existing architecture on the site. However, we are concerned that the mass of the addition as proposed would crowd the historic church building. To provide space between the buildings and to preserve significant streetscape views of the church, we would like to see the new courtyard be of a similar width to that of the existing courtyard to the east. To achieve this, we feel a three bay wide addition as represented by the primary facade of the addition would be most appropriate in this location. But at the very least, we would encourage efforts to minimize and narrow the east wing of the proposed addition to help the courtyard widths be more similar. And we also feel that there's an opportunity to bring the overall height of the addition down by at least a foot by minimizing the height of the cornice. And together, these revisions we feel would help the addition relate more sensitively to this important category one building while still allowing this growing congregation to achieve their programmatic needs. 
Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? And then we have one other. Um, Will Hamilton, and you should be able to unmute yourself. Thank you, Alex. This is Will Hamilton with Historic Charleston Foundation. We'd also like to thank the applicant for giving us an opportunity to review the design ahead of this afternoon's meeting. Uh, we feel as though this, uh, the proposed design for this edition is successful in regards to the general architectural direction, but there are a few notable items we feel need to be addressed during this phase of the design review process. We feel the design for the east facade facing the church works well. However, we would prefer to see more of the proposed glass treatment at the large blank stucco panels located at the second floor southeast corner of the proposed addition. We feel these panels will be more cohesive if the glass treatment is included here as well. Um, comparable to the Preservation Society, we'd also request the proposed addition be moved further away from the church to provide for more visual prominence for the historic church and um, in doing so result in similarly sized courtyards, which would be preferable. So in general, we're pleased with the direction of the design and hopeful the board will consider the previously mentioned recommendations when making their decision. Thank you. Okay, Alex, do we have any other verbal comment before I read? No other verbal comment, just the one letter. Okay, uh, well, let me read that into the record. This is from the Harlson Village Association. Um, there is one, there is yes. one other uh, letter from um, Susan Carter. Okay, uh, was, was she part of the applicant, uh, applicant team? Uh, she's or is she... not yet spoken. Okay, so, but she was part of the applicant presentation, correct? Well, I straight went back and forth and said uh, public comment would be best best with uh, Alex and, and Lawrence because it's the, really the congregations, uh, you know, we didn't want to submit 600 letters, so we put it in one letter. <laughs> uh, has that been, has that been uh, submitted to the city at this point? Or is, or is uh, Susan available to, to speak? She is Before available. We, it would probably be best that she then speak uh, because I don't have the letter here to, to, to read it. Okay. This is Susan Carter. I'm happy to read the letter. At sure. this point. Is that correct? Yeah, that's fine. Thank you all very much for the opportunity. Um, the letter is from Dean Michael Wright, People's Warden Barry Gum, and I, and I am the Dean's Warden. So we thank you for this opportunity. Dear members of the Board of Architectural Review, on behalf of the members, clergy, and vestry of Grace Church Cathedral, we write to ask your support for the construction of a new cathedral hall and for the renovation of the 1959 Johnson Building, both at 98 Wentworth Street. Grace Church Cathedral is a vibrant, growing Episcopal church in the heart of downtown Charleston, adjacent to the College of Charleston and Mount Zion AME Church on Glebe Street. Admitted to the diocese in 1846, Grace Church was built in 1847 and enjoyed the membership of 60 parishioners. Under the leadership of Rector William Ray from 1902 to 1946, the church grew to 800 members. Rector Ralph Meadowcroft noted the membership was in excess of 1,000 people by the early 1960s. In 2005, the membership numbered 1,575, and today, under the leadership of D Dean J. Michael A. Wright, the congregation numbers 3,250 individuals. 1,066 communic are communicants under the age of 16. In 2015, Grace Church became the cathedral for the Diocese of South Carolina. In 2019, the average Sunday attendance at Grace Church Cathedral was 820 worshipers. Over the course of the year, Holy Eucharist was celebrated 566 times and 216 daily offices were offered in the cathedral. Hospitality, each Sunday after the 9 and the 11 a.m. services, 
the hospitality committee prepares and serves refreshments for approximately 250 people per service to give members and visitors an opportunity to have some meaningful interaction. Community, in addition to- uh, uh, Excuse me, Ms. Ms. Uh, uh, Ms. Carter, I, not to stop your flow, but considering the, the jurisdiction of the board, if you could speak to the architectural merit of the project, I think we, I think we have a sense of the, of the programmatic need, but we, we study the architectural merit. So if you could speak to that a little more specifically, please. Uh, certainly. Um, you can just say you think it looks great. <laughs> I think it looks great. And I understand um, mm -hmm. the community concerns. We're trying to maximize every little piece of property that we've got to, to support this vibrant church in downtown Charleston. So that said, we're delighted with it. Great. Right. Thank you. Uh, Alex, any other uh, verbal comment before I read this letter in? That, that should be it. Okay. All right. Well, let me, let me, uh, I'll, I'll paraphrase this to a certain degree just for, just for brevity. This is from the Harlson Village Association. Uh, dear BAR members, Harlson Village met with the great staff and Mr. Young to review this application. We are supportive of the church plans to construct a new gathering hall building. However, we have the following concerns. We fear that the building may, uh, as designed, may overwhelm the historic church, in particular the scale and proximity of the two story glass wall projection opposite the stained glass windows of the sanctuary's west elevation. Though Hanahan Hall to the east of the church and the new structure may not match exactly in design, we feel the height and width of the facades as well as their setbacks from the street should match closely, if not exactly. And then third, we ask that the handicapped entry be restudied to eliminate the raised terrace and railings of the street facade. A gathering vestibule with dual entrances at the west and south facade should, should rectify this problem and allow more room for a landscape buffer in the parking area to the west. Uh, we ask that these concerns be uh, considered as the board reviews and makes your recommendations. Thank you for your consideration. Uh, sincerely, Harlson Village Association PAR Committee, Philip Dufford, David Dumas, Yvonne Fortenberry, and Jim Lundy. All right, so I guess that's the end of public comment. So, Mr. Lindsay, city recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, moving on to the city staff's review. Uh, in general, we think the project is well conceived to bookend to Hanahan Hall to the east. And the overall cathedral complex is uh, deferential to the cathedral in terms of massing and the articulation of its architectural elements. To move on to our specific comments. Um, first, to further reinforce the deferential approach to the design, the project would benefit from minor reductions in height where possible while maintaining the, ver the vertical proportions as follows. Um, first, the vertical space between the windows on the first and second floor may be, may be a place to reduce height as well as at the front portion of the cornice and parapet. And the second is the second floor office ceiling height at 11 foot with an apparent four or so foot interstitial space um, might be reduced. With that said, I'd like to just add into the record that we have heard, uh, I think, a fairly clear and persuasive um, presentation from the applicant that justifies the height of the ceilings and the height of the building that we were not privileged to in writing these. So I would encourage the board to take the, um, the applicant's comments regarding the height into consideration um, when looking at that, that staff comment. The second uh, comment is the new construction comes uh, close to the northwest corner of the cathedral and staff recommends backing off the historic structure uh, around 10 feet if possible to the face of the buttress and putting into place a protection plan prior to the work close to this category one structure. And what we're referring to there specifically is the kitchen, the one story kitchen which is in the very close to the, uh, the rear of the building that comes very close to the existing cathedral where, uh, where it is on the ground plane. So that's what we're referring to. And to maybe clarify that, if you'll permit, I might just briefly go back to a plan so that we can highlight that. And I don't know if you can see my cursor, but you can see um, right here, that specific area we feel, um, it might be best if you could uh, back away from it a little bit. And moving to our, back to um, third comment. Um, there is a, a slightly more elaborate uh, cornice at the setback portion of the building and, and the lowered portion of the addition to the east that should be simplified and minimi minimized to be similar to that of the addition's main body. And that's on A204. And if I may just attempt to find that, we're referring to this, uh, this cornice right here. And it's a minor detail, but perhaps it could be, um, 
simplified to be more like the main um, the main additions corners. And with uh, with those comments, um, the staff recommendation is for conceptual approval. Um, any applicant clarification or response to either public comment or the city's comments? There we go. Uh, <laughs> uh, public comment, I would just say that um, we, Grace Church has always been a, a very welcoming community and we do think that it's important to bring um, the handicap access to the front of the building. Okay, is that it? That's it. Okay, well, moving on then to board discussion. Uh, well, Jay, I'll go. This is James. Uh, this church is a very welcoming community. Um, I have many friends that go there, and um, their commitment to this project and commitment to maintaining the church uh, you know, throughout history has been uh, you know, second to none. But as you've stated several times, our job here is to look at the, the architectural portion of it, and not the, the the programming portion of it, and. The cathedral is is uh, magnificent, and mm -hmm. uh, I believe that the addition uh, overwhelms the cathedral. Um, you know, it, it, it's it's an amazing structure, and I believe that blocking large portions of the of the cathedral from view, as you're looking, you know, northeast on Wentworth Street. Um, standing maybe in front of where the Croft Building is now, or even more to the west of that, you know, you lose this 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 uh, this this structure completely conceals that view unless you're looking straight down between the two buildings. Um, I, I also uh, you know, um, look at the distance between the proposed structure and the cathedral, and the distance between the cathedral and the building to the east. And, and uh, if I look at it straight on, um, there seems to be less um, area in between the proposed structure in the cathedral and the cathedral and the structure to the uh, east. Um, it, 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 it looks um, exactly like what Ms. Carter says. And, and I realized, Jay, you had prompted her to get off her letter and she just uh, kind of ad-libbed this, but it does look like the goal is to take advantage of all maxim to maximize the uh, all building um, property opportunities and put as big a structure there as you you know as you can get. And um, uh, now uh, I do also want to make clear uh, the detailing on the addition. I think also looks good, and and I like the glass. It's, it's just that it's adjacent to a Category One structure, and, and it and um, it's, it seems difficult for me to. Uh, kind of appreciate the blocking of that cathedral visually. Okay, Mr. Scott, any comment? I have no comments. All right, well, I'll, I'll uh, add to this. I think, you know, the, the design of the structure is, is uh, very elegant, although it is a matter of the site plan. Um, I, what I'm concerned about more than anything else is the proximity of this addition to uh, to the, the cathedral itself. You know, over on the other side at Hanahan Hall and the Columbarium, uh, you have you have a cloister that creates a room, and I am really concerned that the the room that's created uh, between the this proposed addition and the and the cathedral itself is really going to feel more like a slot or a residual space. Um, at that 20 some odd feet width, considering the scale of the building that, that frames this space uh, and considering that there's really nothing at its terminus other than just a blank wall of the dishwashing area, um, I, I think that there's an opportunity that has not been taken here with the, the character of this space. And, uh, you know, I don't think it has to necessarily match the rather broad width of the courtyard to the east, but it's probably too close as it stands right now. So, and, and I think that pretty well dovetails with some of the public comment we received and what uh, Mr. Metters was saying, but I'll just add that into the mix. Any other um, board comment or a motion? 
I have a clarification. Go ahead. Uh, it's it's not quite correct um, to say that you don't um, see the cathedral unless you're standing right in front of it. We we did study that a good amount. Um, you pick up a good amount of the stained glass windows, and I think if you look back at the photos, the College of Charleston buildings block some of the cathedrals you come down. To, um, so I just don't think that's quite accurate, quite an accurate statement by Mr. Matters. Uh, I would also say this is not the largest building we could put on the site. We started there and we we downplayed, um, we brought it down a, a whole lot. But that's also not accurate. Okay. Um, let's stop there and get back to board discussion. Any further discussion or a motion? It's either an advantage or a disadvantage that as chair, I can't make a motion. So y'all are up. It's up to y'all now. Well, I, I, this is Leon and I, I, I um, yeah, it's a tough one. I, I but I, I, I do, uh, I do agree with James um, that it would, uh, you know, in terms of the view and, 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 um, uh, you know, the space, I, I, I kind of, I, I believe that, yeah, that it would probably uh, have some disruption of the, the view. So um, I'm going to kind of take the lead here from James and, um, and, and, and uh, I, 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 I'm in agreement with him. So James, I'm going to let you. Uh, Uh, public you, service. You want yeah, me to I, make the motion, Leah? You can make the motion, yes. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, I would uh, make the motion that we deny conceptual approval and uh, uh, incorporate, uh, of course, the, the, the notes from the staff and uh, board notes. And So just to make sure I understood that correctly, it's a, a motion for denial, not deferral. Correct. All right, so a denial. So explain it to me, Jay. explain So in, 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 uh, in raw terms, a denial is uh, start over. Uh, but it sounds like from the, from the uh, public comment. From I'm, the I'm city's comfortable recommendation, with deferral. Yeah, I'm comfortable okay. with deferral. Yeah. yeah, it sounds like there's a, a few specific all. issues yeah. that yeah. can be so so the motion then is uh, deferral. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, comfortable with that. Yep. Okay. I am um, of conceptual approval incorporating board and staff comments. Do you want to add anything specific regarding this the scale or placement of the building in accordance with your your commentary? Uh, no, I, I don't okay. I don't think I can, can do that. Okay, so we have a motion then for deferral of conceptual approval, uh, incorporating board and staff comments. Uh, Mr. Scott, do you second? I, I will second. All right, so Mr. Metters, how do you vote? I in favor. Uh, Mr. Scott? Yeah, in favor. And I will vote uh, yay in favor. So the, the motion carries 3-0. Thank you for that clarification, Jay. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. I think probably there are about four four hearts that stopped completely there yeah. for a second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so, that was yeah. the intent. Yeah. <laughs> that was the intent. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's great. All right. Uh, I guess we can move on. Okay. Um, very good. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, we will move on to our next item. So uh, this is agenda item number four, which I presume that all of you are familiar with. This is four to six Gadsden Street. And this is a request for final approval for new construction of four townhouses. This is in Harleston Village. It's a three-story height district. And of course, it's in the old and historic district. Many of you know this, this site. As I said, you probably reviewed it before in your sessions. Um, a historic building stood here, which, uh, which fell a number of years ago. I, was act I had the, the sad privilege of actually being there when the various stages of collapse happened on this building, coincidentally. I remember it was a very, very cold day. Um, this site was a challenging one for the, the historic foundation. The building is no longer there. Um, so this is just a view from the corner of Gazden and Bufane. 
This is a caddy corner to the site looking uh, toward the Ashley River, looking back toward uh, the center of downtown. The site is on your left. And because again, this is final, we'll just briefly review um, the previous motion, which is preliminary approval with staff comments um, with one exception and the board comments um, where that brick is an improvement and that the cast stone of the parapet may not be necessary. Uh, the board also agreed with all the staff comments and the staff recommendation. And they uh, agreed that um, it does not need to be stone at the parapet. So uh, with that said, um, we will move to the applicant's presentation. All right, I believe I just promoted Joe Smith to an applicant and you can unmute yourself and turn on your camera if you have it. Joe is here, but he's still muted. Okay, Mr. Schmidt, thank you for your presentation. Moving on to <laughs> <laughs> a very efficient presentation for a final, uh, final review. Um, <laughs> Alex, perhaps you could unmute I'm, Mr. Schmidt if he's having trouble. I'm, I'm, I'm clicking on where it says ask to unmute. And he's um, still muted. Maybe it's stalled on his end somehow. Try putting them back as an attendee and bringing them back in. Maybe that'll help. Okay. Make sure you're back as a panelist, so you should be able to unmute yourself. And Alex, uh, just I'm just texting him and not getting a, um, a positive indication that he is present in that way. Um, it says that he is not in the meeting, so we may want to um, see if we can reach out to him by phone or encourage him to call in by phone. Apologies, everyone. This is the nature of virtual meetings. Bear with us for a moment while we have our attendee. Um, I'll, I'll, I've got his number here. I can call him if that's, if that's helpful. You may want to go ahead and do that, and then. Uh, okay. And then in the meantime, we will um, meet we'll Great. Thank you, Alex. And I'm going to continue to try uh, on my end to see if we can get Mr. Schmidt um, on audio and camera. Jacob, would you consider just moving forward to the next one and then coming back to Joe? If we can't, I'll wait on um, I'll wait on Alex Lawrence, and we're all working simultaneously here to get in touch with Joe. Um, if we can't get him in just one moment, um, certainly we'll we'll move to our next item. But if y'all if y'all don't mind, maybe bear with us for just another minute while we work through a tech issue. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Of course, thank you. All. Um, having moved five board meetings online, you think we would have these things all ironed out, but sometimes uh, even our best efforts will will stumble occasionally. You can see Alex has him on phone, so we'll uh, we'll bear with it, and I'm sure we'll get him here shortly.
Okay, I just spoke to Joe and he's going to call in and then I will allow him to speak. Great. I see where he's called in and going to allow you to speak. And then Joe, if you can log out on your Zoom so it doesn't echo, that would be helpful too. Do I, how do I do that? So just, do you have it on your computer? Yes. You can, um, also, we, you can also computer just, off. You could just mute it. To, yeah, if you can just silence. turn off the, turn off your speakers, Joe. Just um, or, or turn the volume down on your computer all the way. That'll prevent your echo. Um, we're not talking to the brightest light bulb here. Where's the volume? <laughs> And failing, failing all else, you could also log out as Alex uh, suggested. Or if you're using a PC in the bottom right hand corner next to the time and date, there should be like a little um, um, like microphone thing and you can silence the speakers there. Or turn it all the way down to zero. Didn't do anything? No. This is my daughter's laptop, so I don't know what I'm doing. Okay. And you, you may also just want to mute yourself there, Joe, on your actual Zoom on your computer in the upper right hand corner of um, yours. You should have a mute, or in the lower left hand of your Zoom terminal, you should have a mute button. If you hit that as well, you should be good to go. And echo doesn't seem too terrible on my end, so I'll um, defer to Mr. Chair if you want to proceed. Yeah, let's go ahead and get going. Okay. Might help if I back up. <laughs> we're, 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 uh, it sounds good on our end. Yeah, let's just go ahead and proceed. All right, I apologize. The um, first item that we were able to address was 4B. There is a, a peer that was described as a historic peer. It is not a historic peer. It was put in perhaps in the, when I went back and looked at it, I'd say 1960s to 1980s. It's a modern brick painted. It, it, Zeno, it was what they did is they punched a hole in the original wall. That's a good picture right there that you have. Yeah. 
also shows up on screen 11. Might be actually better. Okay, what you're looking at on the top picture is a very small brick panel in the retaining wall system where all the other brick panels in the entire wall around the property are historic and they're all equally about eight feet. That particular brick inset panel is only about three feet and it's new brick. It returns and goes in and goes to that pier. That pier aligned with the house that was torn down. So that driveway is only about eight feet wide. If you look at screen 56, And uh, Mr. Schmidt, I don't have that same number. Oh, okay, there we go. I see your numbering system. Which uh, which number was that that you were requesting? 56. So I don't have those numbers in the same way in my lower right-hand corner. You can see this uh, these page numbers. I have 73, 74, 75. Oh. Okay. Perhaps you could uh, give me some direction there. It's uh, the Fire Protection Plan by HLA. And it's their sheet 9 and 14. Uh, understood and if you give me just one moment mr schmidt i will um go to that slide which is much further down than our slideshow and i'll and i'll start describing it the city fire department requires a 20-foot opening to get into this site since we've got multiple residences and particularly the isolated residents back in the corner, which is for gas. This is HLA's drawing, not, not our drawing. So Mr. Schmidt, what I'm going through here are the, um, the, slides, the slides that were given to us. And so if you want to just guide me through, uh, through the sequence in terms of which one you'd like to uh, number, see. Number four, I mean, I'm sorry, number nine. Understood, thank you, sir. There you go. There we go. Do you see the dotted lines? That's what we were required to be able to pull a fire truck in there and battle the fire for four Gadsden. So our point is we cannot leave that pier there. That pier is also not in line with the rest of the retaining wall. It's been set inward uh, for a prior gate. We really don't have a choice here. So to recap, it's, it's, it's not historic and it is not functional for a multi-family developed site. And we apologize for that. Our response for number five, which is, was to take the skylight off the roof of the, uh, stair that goes to the roof. We could do that, but it won't lower the roof at all. We've lowered it as much as possible. And it's set back far enough from the site, from, the, from Bufane Street, that as we talked about this in the first BAR meeting, when the board decided this was a um, a feature that could remain, we don't believe it's going to be visible. Item number six, they asked us to remove a window from the west elevation, and we did that. Item number seven, they asked for all the parts of the Marvin system to be aluminum without any interjection of wood pieces. And we've done that. Item number eight, we were asked to remove a uh, one of the side lights on the side doors on the porch, and we did. Item number nine, we we're in complete agreement with. That's already done. Item number ten, 
clarification that's done. Item number 11 was to not have a stucco indent between the townhouses. We need to have an indent. We can't do it in brick, but it was shown as synthetic stucco, and we've changed that to a full three coat, seven eighths inch stucco. The question from the staff's point of view was, how durable is this item? That is a strong design element, and we did not want to get rid of that indent and have a flush wall. Item number 12 was a clarification about um, how the handrails and uh, other aluminum parts were put together with a minimal amount of fasteners, and we have done that. Also included in your package is the mock-up for the uh, for the actual mock-up plan and get that approved location, as well as we've included photographs of all the major exterior materials. I would say the biggest item of contention that I felt we had after the last meeting was that driveway pier. And again, to reiterate, it definitely has nothing to do with the rest of that wall that was built in 1852 or whenever they put it up. And its removal does not, uh, if anything, is actually a way of enhancing what was real and leaving what's real and not creating something that was not. And because of all these echoes, I'm going to stop now and let you all uh, discuss it, and then I'll jump back in with any questions. Okay. Any questions for the applicant? Yeah. Hearing none. Um, at this point, Joe, if you could mute all of your audio, just that'll uh, actually just mute your phone. And then that'll stop the echo while we go through public comment, if there is any. All right, uh, Mr. Howell, any public comment? No public comment. Okay, well, moving on then to city comments and recommendation. Very good, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just gonna go to our comments page here. Um, this is a final review, as you are aware. And um, we we have reviewed these and, and the staff uh, comments are that this iteration of the project is not different from what the board has previously seen. Um, the board and staff comments have been almost entirely incorporated and Mr. Schmidt did note the differences. And um, we have further reviewed this, to also put on the record, have further reviewed this, this item of the pier, which he has referred to on the northern side of the property. And we agree with the architect that in fact, this is a non-historic element in further review and its demolition is appropriate. Um, so we recommend final approval. Okay. Um, Mr. Schmidt, any clarification to uh, what Mr. Lindsay just said? I assume not, but let me know if so. All right. Well, hearing none, we'll go on to board discussion and a motion. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Leon, I'll uh, yep. make a motion if, uh, if it's okay with y'all. Yep. Me? I'll make a move, we'll yep. move for final approval. And I will second that. All right, so we have a motion made and seconded for final approval. Uh, Mr. Matters, how do you vote? I in favor. And Mr. Scott? Yeah, in favor. And I vote yay in favor. So the motion carries 3 0. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, members of the board. If you are ready, we can um, go ahead and move on to our fifth and final item. Yep, let's do it. Very good. Um, agenda item number five. This is 194 Cannon Street, which is a hotel. Um, this is conceptual approval request for new construction of a 175 room hotel. Um, this is in a height district 85, 125, and in the old city district. 
You have reviewed this once before. As a refresher, this site sits in between the two lanes of the Septima Clark Parkway, um, Cannes, what is labeled Cannon Street on the south and then Spring Street on the north. It is located also strategically in between the medical districts to the south and the West Edge development to the north, as well as the Gadsden Green neighborhood and the West Side neighborhood to the north. These are a few photos of the site. You can see um, this, this uh, Los Long uh, former fast food uh, building, which served, I think, in many iterations as a number of different fast food uh, uh, brands. This is viewing to the south. You can see the MUSC parking deck to the left and the B Street lofts. Um, the Comfort Inn on the right. Um, looking across the site, you can see its current condition, and this is looking toward um, toward the West Edge development. And this is uh, uh, just a shot of the site here, which is on your left, facing the MUSC parking garage uh, directly in front of you. Now, to review um, just briefly the previous motion, which was denial of the application for conceptual approval, including the staff and board comments. That was, uh, that was back June 10th. And the board comments were that the height, scale, and mass works, but the general architectural direction does not. Um, we need a building and not a sculpture. Um, can be started over for general architectural direction, but not with the scale. The proposal is scaleless and does not enhance the area and uh, it agreed with staff. Um, the staff noted it was unfortunate that the city agreed to the PUD in regard to the mass and height um, and think about a flat iron building to make a statement um, and deny the conceptual approval. They also noted that it's a gateway, um, it has a strong sort of corporate design and agree with the comments there. Um, nothing additional to add, uh, agreed with prior comments. So this was a, a widespread sort of um, sense that the architectural design was not on point in the previous version. And uh, with that said, um, I will turn it back over to you, Mr. Chair, for the applicant's presentation. Okay, Alex, who is giving the presentation? Got a couple of different applicant um, speakers. I think some of them will be together. Um, let me see if I can find them all. Okay. I think. Should all be um, now panelists and can unmute and turn on the camera. Are we good? Yeah. It looks, You're good? Yeah. Okay, yeah, thank yeah. you. Um, I'm Richard Gow with LS3P here with uh, Jeffrey Rendering and our client is listening in as uh, are a couple of other team members here. Um, I, I would say that after a denial like we had, uh, we would like to ask the chair uh, for some extra time to go through some of the details of what we're doing to make sure that we get real clear. Um, I, I, I think adding an extra 10 minutes would be uh, asking for much, but it might take more than 15. So I okay. just want, want to do that. And Somewhere then between uh, 10 and 15 minutes. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> I, I, I also want to, I also want to thank you for your service. Uh, we know how difficult this has been just from uh, getting people on and we know what our town is going through and how important it is to kind of keep business and other things going forward. And with Mr. Dowd leaving, uh, that's <laughs> double stop. Uh, because, uh, because of the uh, uh, changing. So um, what we're going to try to do as much as possible is, is try to keep this contextual because there is a certainly uh, a different team uh, that's doing this and, and Jacob knows what he's doing. Um, but for the purpose of, of uh, setting that context, you know, we were denied last time, uh, 15 or 20 people wrote in. It was a, a resounding kind of rejection by the, the populace as to how the building looked. And uh, but I do want to take away some positives from last meeting because we had to grow on what we had uh, to begin with. And uh, we, we were told that the building needed to relate more to the character of Charleston and it wasn't a question of contemporary or traditional. We feel that a lot of the work that we've done uh, has been to create a detailing that is contemporary, but it's, it's uh, rooted in the, uh, the principles of Charleston uh, BAR uh, architecture. 
We do have uh, shutter-like screens next to our windows. We still have a glassy base, but the, the base has been handled differently with columns that meet the ground. Um, uh, we were told uh, in item four of the staff comments that the material palette was really of a very good quality. So we didn't change anything there, um, except to uh, maybe not have some of the uh, fins that we did. Uh, we were also, just, and this is a, a point, uh, we, were, we were offered conceptual approval by Mr. Dowd as a staff recommendation for height and mass. And that's very important because uh, with a site of this size and the building footprints of what we have, that, that's very important that we can rely on that going forward. And he said the, the height and mass were well conceived. Um, so we, we, we received conceptual approval of, of two out of the four uh, prongs of that test. And we know that it's not a, a, a by entitlement um, at all. It still has to meet the way you feel about it. We gave it a complete relook. And we acknowledge, uh, as Mr. Uh, White uh, professed, that it has to be a building. And it has to work with the, uh, the BAR uh, principles. And in order to be a building, we felt like we had to go to the root of the elements of the building. And you'll see a lot of studies from Mr. Rengering to help build this large facade from the kernel of the fenestration and how uh, that was uh, extrapolated into a, a, an articulate uh, piece of architecture. We, we are rooted in the 21st century. And I think just to be clear, there are 16 principles. I'm gonna run through them really quickly, but we would hope that during this process, if, if we are going awry in your opinion on one of these things, just use, use the principle as a way of communicating that so we can focus. Um, principle number one, higher ceiling heights, we have that. Um, uh, principle number two, a high quality tactile and visual experience at, uh, to the passerby. We have added a layer at the ground floor with columns. Uh, they suggest an arcade. And I think uh, Michael Maher's letter to you will uh, uh, confirm that. Um, the base uh, should be taller. We have increased the base uh, three feet to cheat into the second floor to, to, to uh, increase that. Uh, vertical orientation principle, uh, everything we did here was to increase the vertical, but not too vertical. Uh, work in harmony with surrounding buildings. Um, as the surrounding buildings are of uh, different places and different sizes, we did the best we can and uh, to articulate a public realm where we have pedestrian activity. Um, the visual appearance of parking lots and garages does not apply to this pro uh, property. The court that we have outside will be very well appointed. Uh, the street life on the sidewalk will be supported. The ground floor has been enhanced and it has architectural features to, to, to add scale. Um, the Charleston uh, building should have authenticity. Mr. S uh, Dowd had said that the material palette was of good quality. Um, the authenticity of construction should be supported. We have very few materials and they, we tried to keep the building very legible and very simple uh, since the last one was busy and jarring and a lot of other nasty things that people said. Um, the harmony of the building facades and the streetscape should be enhanced. The hotel is an isolated building. It doesn't have a streetscape like King Street. We're not fitting into adjacent facades. So we, we, we created a harmonious uh, relationship between the smaller forms and the larger forms. Buildings uh, for the principle about energy efficiency. We have clear glazing, it's low E. We do have lots of vertical windows. The proportions are two, uh, 2.75 to one. Uh, the size and frequency of windows, um, uh, Jeffrey will get into. We do a, a good job of that, I believe. Uh, the smaller windows are above on the top floor, uh, like a lot of uh, buildings that we love in Charleston. Um, we do have mullions in our windows. Uh, we do have deeply recessed windows with the added window surrounds to create not only a, a, a Charleston approach to uh, dealing with windows, but we, uh, that added depth, only a couple left. Um, we will add detail uh, in preliminary to the base and to the canopies. And the Charleston tradition of adopting uh, climate, climate mitigating elements, we have roof overhangs, we have arcades, we have uh, pieces that feel like porches. We have pieces that feel like shutters. 
And all of those things are very good. They, help, uh, they helped us in assessing our own approach to general architectural direction and scale. And I, uh, I believe that we've done a good job and we've had a lot of help here. So thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you, Rich. Um, if you could advance a couple slides, uh, we can get started in here. Just, uh, Mr. Lindsay did a great job giving an overview. I'll make these kind of quick. Uh, Sanborn map kind of shows that the site and the context surrounding us is very new. Uh, next slide. Again, as you stated, um, cannons to the or sorry, cannons to the south and uh, Spring Street is to the north, kind of segregating our site from the West Edge and the Meckle District to the south of us. Next slide, please. A couple of photos that you've already seen and you will see again with the building superimposed in. Uh, one image I want to call attention to is the bottom right, uh, the view of the existing landscape buffer that the park that um, is adjacent to ours to the west uh, is already existing, obviously, but we will also be enhancing this in our, as we study go forward. <clears throat> Next slide, please. A couple of different views from Cannon Street on the top upper left and upper right is the view from Spring Street as you leave in town. Uh, next slide, please. Um, at last time, we received some comments uh, to include photos of a physical model to help uh, show the building and share it in its context. As you can see, again, it's very isolated from uh, the context around us to the west um, and to the southeast. Uh, the massing is very simple, obviously, in this. 3D form this physical model due to the scale. Next slide, please. Um, streetscape, you know, as Rich said, that height and scale, or sorry, height and mass uh, were proved conceptually at the prior design. Um, we did not play with the height, you know, although we did kind of relook at the mass as we restudied uh, the design. Continue, please. So here's the site comparison. I don't think, I don't know if you can zoom in. <laughs> Uh, but if not, we'll move to the next slide here. But um, although we were denied uh, previously, um, the site concept was really well conceived. Uh, so as we restudied, uh, thank you, as we studied the mass scene and, and the design here, we um, took additional steps to enhance the site plan and, and delineate the pedestrian experience along the Spring Street side um, by further studying the building to the south, uh, creates a greater landscape buffer and also reworking the program in the upper right corner of the site here uh, allows us to have a more generous courtyard uh, at that corner. And the porch on Cannon. And the porch uh, on Cannon on to the south, which we'll see further on, uh, invites as they're approaching from the park to enter our site there and leave the street side. Next slide, please. Uh, a couple of precedents we wanted to look at on, the, on these next few slides. Each show a clear and defined base metal top they each have deep set windows, uh, vertical portions, along with a horizontal rhythm. Um, Mr. Dowd and his previous comments mentioned the Dewberry Hotel as being a, uh, a good precedent for us to take a look at. It has lots of repetitive windows um, and a clear defined top. And the, and the actual penthouse there is pushed back and very gla glassy and clear and a very defined base. Next slide, please. Couple other ones we wanted to look at, the West Edge and Spectator uh, do a great job of showing step down mass concealing a taller tower to the pedestrian front edge, something that we took into consideration on our east and west facades. Um, and then the Middleton Inn, I think is a very um, great present to look at for many projects, but it's very interesting as we studied it for the fenestration, is, which has been set on the grid and actually works at varying scale. So as you step back, each window kind of works together as one giant kind of window and, and fenestration move. And as you get closer, you can see how it's been divided up into an, a grid. Next slide, please. So, move, so moving forward, we're gonna go through a series of studies um, that uh, influence our design and kind of build off of the uh, principles, the Charleston principles that Rich mentioned before. So next slide. So we wanted to start at the structural bay. Um, again, last time heightens and mass were approved, uh, but architectural direction and therefore scale uh, were not approved due to the jarring nature of our busy, busy facade and the shifting sections that we had. Uh, so we wanted to really dive, dive back in, sharpen our pencil and really work hard on the scale, um, which can be defined by individual architectural elements. 
And just like middle to end, these elements should be beautiful individually, but as the greater whole as well. So um, looking here at the, at the first one, you know, we, we looked at combining the shutter, the vertical louvers with the windows themselves, but found that the ratio was, was closer to two to one and not really appropriate and felt uh, less vertical in orientation. Um, so as we moved from, from that one to B, we uh, looked at making taller windows and isolating the um, vertical louvers, the shutters, um, from, from the window system itself, which gave us that three to one, closer to three to one uh, ratio. But here, the, the two height base um, we studied there, but this, can, uh, this counted it due to the scale. Uh, we feel that the larger floor plan, or sorry, the larger base height uh, that Rich mentioned before already gave us a prominent base. But uh, we also lost the ability to have a, a delineated top floor in that scheme. Moving on to C, we wanted to explore um, looking at varying the window groupings instead of just doing two, you know, looking at doing some different moves there. But we felt that was just unnecessary complication to the mill section and kind of going back to some of the comments we received previously. So we landed at the D here, the proposed structural bay kind of design it has a very clean horizontal rhythm. Uh, vertical proportions, the structures brought to the ground, very defined base, middle, and top. Uh, and there's a subtle move of uh, differentiating this window sizing and also shifting the, uh, the shutter there at the top that helps enforce that uh, top level. Next slide, please. So then we took that structural bay and um, spread it across the, the elevation. And this isn't necessarily a specific elevation we're looking at, um, but mainly on the two longer sides, we want to, to study this. Uh, so we felt that <clears throat> the horizontal rhythm and the vertical orientation of this grid uh, reflects and reinforces the Charleston principles that we mentioned prior. Um, the two-story window move here reduces the overall scale of the taller structure. And by bringing the columns down to the ground, we also help reduce the scale of the building um, and you can kind of see how tall they are by looking in the lower left corner, you can see some scale figures there. Uh, next slide, please. So then we went into the individual window itself and studied that. Um, so these next two slides will be studying the fenestration. This first one, we wanted to, again, go back to the roots of Charleston and look at the typology, um, which has a lot of expressive uh, window surrounds, as you can see from the two images on the left here, just a couple that we grabbed off of. King Street, um, which adds depth to the facade and also creates a nice play of shadow and light. Um, but over time, you know, this, this surround has evolved um, and has actually been used uh, by the two images to the right here, also been used to help um, control solar gain and solar heat, uh, sustainability practice that uh, is inherent in all of Charleston architecture. Next slide, please. So diving into the window here, we felt that a vertical floor-to-floor -floor, uh, window was applicable and allows for a greater depth of light to penetrate the rooms while keeping the uh, correct proportions. Um, so as you can see, A, B, and C here are all similar. They all um, look at recessing the window, the typical depth that we do in most projects at four inches from the, from the face of the facade. But in this situation of building this scale, we felt that the elevation, the facade would still appear flat. Uh, so when we started D, we wanted to, uh, to increase the depth, or at least the expression of the depth of the window. So we added an extruded uh, metal frame that also helps uh, <coughs> portions and helps call attention to that. And we also separated the uh, louvered um, section as well. It wow. became more of a shutter to the window um, to the left there. Uh, next slide, please. So then we came to the west facade. Um, taking what we learned from the previous studies, we quickly applied it to the, the west facade, which as you can see in A. And so prior, we've heard a lot of comments um, that the west facade was not inviting, did not feel Charleston, was heavy, uh, and a little bit brutalist and more sculptural uh, and less of a building. So as we applied the two-story frames uh, to that facade, you know, it didn't really keep uh, the principles intact. It became more horizontal, became heavy, didn't feel it was Charleston. Uh, so 
B and C are kind of a similar study where we looked at material changes, but we also grouped uh, full height frames of the middle section. So now we have four height sections there, but we still felt that it was kind of lopsided and, and not quite balanced uh, is what you'd see in typical Charleston architecture with that cantilever um, corner on the right. And so moving into D, we alleviated that by, by cutting that off and, and making it a lighter porch-like element uh, that's grounded with columns. Uh, these columns are different than the other stone columns. They're round, they're made of metal potentially, and, and just more elegant in nature. Um, and that really helped define the base, the middle of the top, and kind of created that welcome element to the south. Uh, next slide, please. And then lastly, we wanted to study the fenestration on the northwest corner. So we purposely uh, worked the program on the ground floor to have as much um, occupiable spaces as possible, uh, everyday occupiable spaces as possible on the Spring Street side. So we obviously had a lobby to the east and at this northwest corner, we have a series of office program and meeting rooms the ground floor. So the first two studies, you know, we're obviously in a floodplain zone. So the first two studies really kind of were derived out of trying to stay out of that floodplain with wind window fenestration. And it just felt really foreign, it felt forced. Uh, we don't really have any horizontal expressions like that in the building. And B, the square windows also felt foreign. Then we moved into C, which also keeps above that, that datum line, um, still felt too square, it just didn't feel appropriate. Uh, Sorry, that was C, I think I might have said D. And D and E we felt are the two kind of most applicable studies here. Um, but D kind of took away from the base uh, definition and looked too similar to the middle section. So it was kind of taken away from enhancing that base element. So in E, which I'm hoping you can see better in your screen, is a little bit washed out of ours. You can see a series of three vertical uh, slot windows that's also kind of represent and, or replicate those you'll see at the top floor uh, where we have that program and where we can open them. And keeping into, you know, the conversation of honesty, we didn't want to add additional windows into the back of house spaces that would just need to be spandrel elements. So we wanted to stay honest with our expression. Uh, next slide, please. So now we're going to move into our proposed design through a series of renderings uh, with some comparison from the prior uh, to the new. You can move forward one slide. So I think right at the bat, you can see a vastly improved building. Uh, we really like how the building reads mm -hmm. approach from Cannon Street connector. It's much lighter, uh, meets the ground, it's, it's anchored, it's um, inviting to the, to the pedestrian on the right side through that porch element. You can move to the next slide to see a, a larger rendering of that. Um, the play of the two forms is actually kind of um, uh, interesting here where you have the, the larger solar structure behind and a two to one ratio with its own kind of porch element with the and then the lower mass um, that is at a height that feels more appropriate uh, to Charleston as you enter in. Uh, so here you can see the comparison at the bridge as you enter from West Ashley. Again, Building is drastically improved. It, it feels lighter and it's more simplified. You can see on the left there, the busyness, the jarring kind of nature of the moving planes, uh, the darker element, darker skin. Uh, and on the right, it feels uh, brighter. Move forward one more slide. That a little bit close and personal. The ground floor here is pushed back, um, which provides ample room for additional landscaping. It also kind of reduces uh, the heaviness of that ground floor. Next slide, please. So here you see the comparison at Spring Street as you're heading out of town. Um, you know, again, I think the east and west facades were the most successful from what we heard last time, but we felt like we could still improve upon them. And so the new design, you can see a smaller form, that smaller two-story mass wrapping uh, along Spring Street there. And again, it brings the scale of the overall building down uh, to the pedestrian level and to something more familiar to the Charleston. Uh, but they're both kind of identify themselves as, a, as separate forms. The glassy corners also make it kind of light and inviting. 
they are not cantilevered. There are round columns um, similar to what you see on the porch on the south side. If you go to the next slide, you, you might be seeing a little clearer there. Maybe you can move to the next slide. Just two more. Just a couple more here. Um, this is a new one that you have not seen before, uh, the approach from Haygood. Uh, you can, I think, is a very elegant uh, look from, from the side. You can see the full length of the facade. And, and similar to the Charleston Aquarium, where the two ends uh, are very light and airy to a solid kind of white mass, we, we again have that glassy corner to the left of the lower mass and the glassy porch like element to the taller mass on the right. Um, we had at the camp of the, of the building here in the middle, you'll see a glass hyphen that was also located at the vertical um, circulation. So as you get off the elevator and the stairs, you have great views to the north uh, and to Wagner Terrace area. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Um, similar view uh, of the Cannon Street Courtyard. And you can, I think right away, you see how this building is much more inviting. Uh, the glass floor reads very bright and, and intriguing to, to, to pull the pedestrian in. Uh, the canopy is anchored by these vertical fins. If you go to the next slide, it'll probably be a little easier to see, uh, which also help kind of differentiate, differentiate uh, the east side of the taller tower from the west. Again, the porch-like element on the south side there on the left side of your screen uh, is a welcome gesture to, to the MUSC campus side. Next slide. And this is the last one we'll end on, where you can see that porch-like element kind of sliding past through the facade of the lower mass and becomes a hyphen at the taller building. But again, I think um, as we saw and walk through that the principles have been met in a very creative way. Uh, we're very excited about this building and we feel like it's a great direction and a great uh, new building for that landscape. Rich, do you want to add anything? No, I think that's good. We'll just take questions now. We're, we're out of time. We're out of time. Thanks. All right. Any questions from the board or staff? Hearing none, we'll move on to public comment. Alex, who do we have lined up? We'll start with Anna Catherine Carroll. Thank you. Anna Catherine Carroll with the Preservation Society of Charleston. The Preservation Society really appreciates the applicant reaching out to us, and we feel the project has taken a step in the right direction. Specifically, we feel positive changes have been made to enhance the activation and treatment of the ground floor with the use of storefront, and the simplified design approach and material palette are significant improvements to the overall architectural direction. However, we feel this could be refined even further. We continue to struggle with the proposed use of a VTAC system that requires a significant amount of aluminum screening, which is our primary concern with this project. We feel the bulky dark screens adjacent to the windows adversely impact the design of the facades by introducing a competing exterior feature. Uh, uh. And we ask that other systems be explored for a more elegant design solution better suited to Charleston. In particular, the top floor we feel needs significant study where the VTAC screening dividing the windows creates a pattern that is jarring in relation to the rhythm of the rest of the building. We would also ask for further study of the projecting lower mass at the northeast corner of the building. Specifically, we do not find treating it in the same architectural language as the main mass works very well. And we feel the approach to differentiating the six story piece on the south elevation to read as a lighter porch like element is very successful. And we would like to see similar thought go into properly differentiating the northeast portion as well. So we would ask that the board defer this request primarily for study of options that would eliminate the VTAC system as proposed. Thank you. Okay, now we have Will Hamilton. Thank you, Alex. This is Will Hamilton again with the Store of Charleston Foundation. Uh, we'd also like to thank the applicant for allowing us to review the updated design prior to this afternoon's hearing. Uh, we feel as though there are a number of positive changes worth noting, including the additional perspective renderings, uh, the adjustments to the building's footprint to allow for a broader buffer at Cannon Street, the photos of the scale model and the detailing of the six-story corner, what I'm going to refer to as the bump out uh, facing Spring Street. 
So previously we commented that the contemporary nature of the design was not problematic and that we wanted to see something that was not as brand driven. We still want to see the design um, that's, that's iconic and that speaks to Charleston architecture. So uh, while the current iteration of this design has been updated, we feel that it still doesn't speak to Charleston architecture and we would not consider it to be a gateway building at this point. Uh, there are a number of items we feel need additional study moving forward before this application receives conceptual approval. Uh, we feel the corner bump out portions would be better suited proportionally if they were included as eight story masses as opposed to six story masses. Ideally, these would both be detailed similarly to the current six story mass facing Spring Street. Uh, we prefer to see the top three stories below the rooftop space treated as a refined glass cornice or top to the building that doesn't include quite as much masonry in that area. Uh, we feel the overhang of the rooftop element is too prominent and should be minimized along with the wood elements. Uh, in general, the rooftop space we feel should be sleeker and more refined. Um, overall, we feel the window fenestration could also be more consistent. And finally, we'd like the applicant to restudy the design of the VTAC grills to include something more visually interesting. Um, so in general, we feel there are too many elements that need to be restudied for us to make a recommendation for conceptual approval. So we'd recommend that the board defer this application to give the design team uh, an opportunity to address the previously mentioned items. Thank you. Okay. Alex, any other uh verbal public comment that you're aware of? No other verbal public comment, <clears throat> just the written comments. Okay, well, then I will move on to those. And again, I'll paraphrase to some extent just for brevity. Uh, the first letter we've received from Kevin Everly on President Street, and uh, this is addressed to Dennis Dow. Dear Dennis, I will be unable to attend the BAR large meeting. I'd like to register my strong opposition to plans at the hotel on Cannon Street. Uh, when the project was submitted earlier, it was correctly rejected as a three-dimensional advertisement instead of a gateway building. Uh, while the current proposal is admittedly unbranded, it is still equally uninspired. Um, the building needs to be far better than average and distinct. I would make this challenge. Describe the proposal's architecture in a few sentences and post the elevations for this hotel and the last four hotels built downtown on a bulletin board. Then ask whether someone could confidently pick this hotel out of the lineup based on nothing more than hearing your description of it. No one could, this is, there is nothing interesting about this building, no notable feature, no interesting form, no, no, no marquee details, a rectangular box with regularly spaced windows. We deserve better, sincerely, Kevin. Now moving on to some other comments. This one from Kiki Caparo. Uh, Charleston does not need another hotel. Uh, okay, this is really a criticism of use, so I'm going to skip that. Uh, another one from Robert Greninger. In, Please don't allow an 11 story hotel project. Uh, Charleston does, need not, does not need another eyesore. Look at what happened to Shim Creek. Uh, and then uh, a, a third from William Reel. I disagree that the proposed design is an improvement, rejecting contemporary building design in favor of monotonous, repetitive, boringly safe designs. Um, only creates a cityscape of buildings that no one pays attention to. Uh, cities that have a vibrant mix of architectural styles in their non-historic districts are exciting to live in. Please stop making the mistakes of other cities with a rich architectural history by watering down any new design. And then the final correspondence is from Michael Maher, the CEO of the West Edge Foundation. Uh, please accept the following responses to the updated design proposals for 194 Canon. Uh, we concur with various voices that the redevelopment of the site presents a unique opportunity, uh, an important or challenging location. The resubmitted conceptual design continues to be responsive to this opportunity. Um, we have been perplexed by conflicting assertions that the site requires a signature building, yet those same voices are concerned that the designs have been too assertive. Um, we continue our enthusiasm for collaborating with the design team on bringing forth positive investment in the west side of the Charleston Peninsula uh, and look forward to seeing a contributory project that helps facilitate community connectivity, economic development, and the other benefits uh, improvements that the site can bring. And that is all the, uh, all the written correspondence. So, Mr. Lindsay. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. 
So we will move on to the, um, the city comments. Rebuttal. Generally speaking, the, the due to this prominent site, um, this building is deserving of the board's highest level of scrutiny. And since the previous submittal, the design has improved significantly, but the architectural expression still needs further refinement. Um, as previously noted, the building's height and disposition have been predetermined by its zoning classification as a planned unit development. And then just to go into our detailed comments, um, the first thing is that the facade design should be further unified and simplified throughout, um, integrating the smaller masses with the larger mass. Second, the window and wall system that is illustrated before and has been discussed needs some further refinement to simplify the recesses and protrusions of elements. The relationships of the planes of these elements needs to be restudied and rendering should be shown accurately depicting the depth and shadow of the exterior wall. Um, stated in the principles, thicker walls with deeply set windows are more appropriate in Charleston uh, to better fit in with the language of the more significant and larger masonry structures, which I think the applicants did speak to. Um, the third comment is that regarding the treatment of the base, um, the facade's vertical grid elements should retain their width all the way to the ground where shown. The applicants have done this, I, I will add for the record. Visually transferring the mass of the building to grade, um, this tectonic expression should apply to both the primary and secondary masses. And what we're really saying there is that um, the staff feel that the, the cantilevering elements on the smaller secondary masses still uh, would be more effective if they transferred their weight all the way to the ground. And the fourth thing is that um, we still would like to see a, a simplification of the material palette. Um, currently indicating uh, aluminum storefront, metal panel, extruded metal frame, curtain wall glazing, centered stone, perforating VTAC screen, and wood. So um, continuing simplification would be a benefit. Um, the staff recommendation is for deferral of the general architectural direction. And I would also like to put on, onto the record that as I think you've heard from the architects, they have listened closely both to the public comment to the board comment last time, and they have read the principles and they have responded to them. This design process is moving in the right direction. The staff simply think it needs to continue that refinement. And with that, I'll end staff, staff comment. Great, okay. And uh, now uh, an opportunity for an applicant response to both public comment and staff comment. Okay, thank you, um, mm -hmm. Mr. White. Um, as far as the VTAX go, uh, we, we feel that the, uh, the, the VTAC screens are an opportunity to add texture and scale. And as we move into uh, further design development, this is something that we feel really can become a shutter-like element uh, that is uh, a positive and reinforces uh, a hierarchy of design. The second thing, uh, the, the call for the overhang uh, thickness on the roof, uh, we, we believe that uh, a, a, an appropriate shade on the top floor of an outdoor space that's some 12 feet in length uh, could probably be uh, worked out in some 12 to 15 inches of, of thickness and could easily be reduced. Um, we feel uh, that the, the two items that Mr. Uh, Lindsay spoke to, uh, I wanted to make sure uh, we were clear on. Uh, we do have columns underneath the cantilevers. The, what we elected to do is on the most pedestrianized corners, actually not have the thick columns, but have smaller round columns and not have those appear like uh, uh, cantilevers. And I, I guess the last statement I would make uh, in, in furthering what uh, Jacob said was, you know, we, we are very committed to meeting with people. We have met with the historical groups two times since the last meeting in two months and would have uh, met with Mr. Dowdmore if he wasn't so frantically trying to uh, exit. Um, and I give him a lot of credit. He, ha he has a busy thing to do. So we, we could not be more committed. And as last time, um, having an approval with conditions is still an acceptable uh, action of this board. And I, and I think you know that we are very uh, sincere in saying that we will make uh, every effort to, to, to adopt and build the consensus that this body has uh, demanded of us over the years. Thank you. Okay, moving on to uh, board discussion and or a motion. So, Jay, I have a um, question. Yeah, I've got... Go ahead, Leon. No, you go ahead. I'll wait. No, no you go ahead. Okay, so, so Jay, just a question. Uh, at our previous meeting, there was no approval for anything, right? Scale uh, and general architectural uh, direction was designed. 
Uh, that's correct. The, the denial was specific to scale and general architectural direction, but, okay. but the board made no corresponding motion to also approve specifically any other element of the proposal. Right. Okay. I just wanted to clarify that. Um, Jay, could, could I hear your comments? My comments? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's a little, uh, it's awfully polite of you. I, I agree, um, with much that has been said about the, the level of refinement, you know, the project, uh, the project has matured, but it, in my view, has not really reached a point where, um, where it's ready for conceptual approval, considering its you know, potential landmark status. I, I don't really see the conflict between having a, you know, a, a prominent sort of landmark building and, and, and one that was too architecturally aggressive. The architectural direction of the previous proposal, you know, we've spoken about that, but um, while the principles have been referred to um, quite ex extensively, it's also been somewhat superficial in that, you know, all these principles have been applied and they are all features of classic Charleston architecture, but the result does not really have much uh, association with even the local precedents that are shown. So I agree with, I agree with the staff recommendation. Could I, I, I got a couple comments. This is Leon, Leon Scott. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, I want to, uh, first, I, I agree. Uh, uh, there's been improvement, but it, it certainly needs more refinement. Um, one of the, the, you mentioned that it was a high quality experience from the passerby. Um, I disagree with that. Um, and also, um, you mentioned that it worked in harmony with the surrounding buildings. I, I disagree with that as well. Um, and and um, I, 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 you, you, you had mentioned something about um, using the Dewberry and a couple of other hotels downtown as examples and so forth. I want to keep, keep in mind that the Dewberry was a government building. Um, so the exterior still exists as, as, as it was. Um, and lastly, um, it just doesn't reinforce the true Charleston character. Um, it's far from that. So um, I, I could not give a conceptual approval. Um, I, I just don't see, uh, I think we're moving in the right direction, but I don't think we're there yet. That's it. Um, the essence of what uh, Leon, Jay, and Jacob uh, have said, I'm, I'm in uh, agreement with. And uh, Jay, I would make a motion for the deferral of the, uh, of the uh, scale and general architectural direction. And I will second that. Would, would you would you wish to include staff and board comment uh, assessment? Yes. 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 Uh, please, please, please excuse me okay. for uh, uh, right. not saying that uh, with staff and uh, and board comments. Excuse okay. Me. So we have a motion for deferral of scale and general architectural direction, uh, including staff and board comments. Uh, Mr. Scott, you seconded that, correct? I I second that, correct. Okay, made and seconded. So, Mr. Metters, how do you vote? Uh, yay in favor. Scott? I vote yay in favor. And I will as well vote yay in favor. The motion carries 3 0. Uh, so, Lindsay, that you. was our last application, correct? Right. Uh, that was the last application, and there are no more slides in this 231 slideshow. So, um, it's a <laughs> short one. Three, 233 slideshow. Um, so that will um, that will conclude, and I will stop our screen share. Thank, thanks, Jacob. Thank you. Yes. Thank well, you all, uh, y'all. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. Well, meeting is adjourned, and I will see y'all in a couple of weeks. Sounds good. Take care, Dave. All, all right. right. Thank Have you. Good all. night. Thank you all. Have a good evening.